Throughout history, jobs have always been displaced by technology, but some arresting claims are being made about the next wave of disruption. Let's get to grips with what's meant by that in this event about the future of work. Hello and welcome to week three of the Disruptive Innovation Festival. My name is Colin Webster and I'm one of the team at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation who've been putting together this online event. This is week three. Um, there's so much to catch up on at thinkdiff.co. So if you've missed out on anything that's happened so far, head there and uh, catch up on all the huge range of events that we've got going on. Now, one of the three themes of the Disruptive Innovation Festival is the future of work. And that's precisely what we're going to look at in this session. I've got with me two guests who've been part of an investigatory panel in the Netherlands looking at the future of work. Uh, they've got various expertise and we'll find out about them as the session goes on. But first, let me just say thank you for joining us, Johan Huren and Saskia van den Mausenbeek. Hello. Hi. Hello. So um, I said you're part of um, this investigatory group. I think you called it an innovation cabinet when we had a discussion before. Right. What Could you tell us, I'll start with you, Saskia, what is this? innovation cabinet that you're part of uh, in the Netherlands? Yes, it's really a group of uh, scientists and entrepreneurs and sort of forward thinkers, some rebels, some people who want to want to make a change in this world and especially helping um, other companies and organizations to cope with the rapid changes that are coming to us. So we try to influence policies and help people with their um, innovation quests. Tell, tell me about some of those innovation quests that you're involved in, Johan. Well, it might be. We have uh, several ministries on this cabinet. So some ministries are about biology, like, like yours is, and mine is about smart technology, creativity, that kind of stuff. So, so it could be that an entrepreneur is asking, I should do something with innovation, perhaps 3D print printing, but what? what? What are the new developments? Uh, I don't have a network and they can ask us and we will help them to set things up. Could also be that uh, we, we are also called a shadow cabinet because we're actually helping the real government as well in uh, evaluating their policies on innovation uh, or trying to propose other solutions. So it's not just what we would call a talking shop, you, you actually feed ideas back to the government who yep. hopefully have a receptive ear. Yeah. Hopefully, yeah. Yes. Hopefully. Yeah. like I said, we, Hopefully. we are the jesters, they are the kings. Yeah. Let's find out about why you're both on, on this, uh, this uh, innovation cabinet. What's, what's your background, uh, Johan? Well, my background is uh, largely uh, AI, artificial intelligence and social robotics. And because those are two really emerging technologies, this is why they asked me to join in. Okay, and we're going to find out about one particularly exciting project that you've been involved in. We'll, yeah. we'll look at that in a few minutes' time. Okay, good. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Saskia, what's your role in this cabinet? Well, yes, my, so my title is a Minister of Forward to Nature. And that is because I, um, I started by Mimicry Netherlands now six years ago, which is a group that is looking to learn from nature to inform our future designs and technologies and, um, and organizations. And this is something that is picking up uh, by universities and, and schools and also organizations. So it's becoming a bigger thing and um, bringing in that biological uh, perspective. Yeah. And that's something we will discuss as we go on this sort of practical right. application of biomimicry yes. and, and what this could mean for the future of work. Yes. I've got just a couple of slides I'm just going to pop up here. Well, first up, here's, here's the kind of statement we read about a lot, right? We see this in newspapers, magazines and so on. Uh, X percent of all jobs that exist today are going to be automated away. And what's, what's your immediate take on this type of statement? Oh, well, my immediate take is always why 20%? Why not 19 or 21 or 5 or 0? Or what's, what, what is this based on? But in essence, I mean, if people are telling me some jobs will go away, other jobs will change and new jobs will emerge, then I say, yes, that's true. Okay, so it's kind of <laughs> half the story, isn't it? When yeah. we say jobs are going to be taken away, it's kind of this, yeah. the scare story that we. Yes. Some jobs, but yeah. they have been taken yeah. away always. 
Like I, I always have the example of clock making or uh, bobbin lace. That's really nice on these uh, rural markets to look at. But I mean, that, that's not something we really do anymore now, do we? Yeah, true. Um, yeah. But Okay, that's great. Um, let's set the scene then for the online audience, what we're going to talk about here. We're going to look at some of the big trends that we think are disrupting the future of work. And we've listed a few of them just there, which also fit very nicely with your expertise, of course. And then later on in the session, we'll, we'll look at some of the outcomes of these trends and some potential solutions, particularly to that last point about unemployment, that displacement point, and yeah. uh, how things can move on. But in preparation for this session, Saskia, you, you were very keen on four particular trends, which are illustrated here nicely. Uh, I think you'd pick this up from maybe it was a McKinsey report or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Th those are not the, I didn't make them up myself, sure, <laughs> but this is sure. something if we start talking about uh, fourth industrial revolution, it's mainly because of, of these trends. And um, so we see on the top left corner, this is all about how the increase of data will change our lives because we will get so much more data to, that we need to process and therefore we need more computational power which will happen and come into our lives. And the data is coming from where? How are we getting this extra data? Well, uh, actually from, from almost everywhere because we, we are, uh, think people, uh, humans, with technology in our hands, we can start um, gather data all ourselves and there's many more organizations that are looking into data everything we do online is being registered and therefore will, will give us more data to work on. Um, and that will sort of inform lots of new products and services and our own behaviors. So this is something that, that will drive many changes. We had uh, an event last week, a lady called Sophie Hackford uh, was speaking about data. And one of the things she said was that um, it's kind of like the telescope. When, when we invented the telescope, suddenly everything we knew about the universe had changed right. because we could see so much yeah. more. Yeah. And she likened that to the data revolution, that mm -hmm. yeah. everything we understand is about to change. It is. And I think the, the, the big question is, so what do we do with all that data? Because having this data doesn't mean that we can, you know, you need to do something with it before you can make informed decisions. And that, that combining all that data, that will be... Uh, I know there's companies that are looking now to get like uh, CDOs, like a chief data officers and whole departments around data. Um, so this data may, you know, this could be an opportunity to create even more jobs in the future. Yeah, and there's a very interesting question as well as who is making the decision. Is that the user or is it the chair the user is sitting on and who is measuring how you are sitting or is it the designer? Or perhaps the one who is manufacturing the, the chair or the insurance company who is measuring that you're not sitting correctly. So, yeah. 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 Kind of makes me want to sit up straight yeah. and you say that. You um, know, and from the biomimicry perspective, lots of, um, we know, we start looking in how processing, how s many organisms are processing data, um, and which is interesting maybe for, for our automotive industry how we know how flocks of birds and fish of schools and flocks of locusts, the swarms, they never collide. And we know now how they do that. And we're trying to make the algorithms to process the data so we can learn from that as well. So that, that's a good mix there. Great. Okay. And we've got a very intelligent audience. I know that. <laughs> but um, for so biomimicry, in case no one's come across it before, 10 second summary is. Okay. So coming from two Greek words, bios meaning life and mimesis meaning to imitate, so learning from life. And uh, um, as a human species, we've only been here for a very short time and many organisms have solved problems that we can learn from. Nice one. Great. Okay. Um, the next slide uh, or the next icon in the top right hand corner is, uh, is that disappeared? There you go. It's troublesome, this thing. Uh, is that data analytics in the top right hand corner? Is that what that's signifying? Yes, I think we, we sort of started discussing yeah. that already with the first picture, but that is really about the data analysis. Um, so how we can turn the data into knowledge, but maybe also this data to track and um, resources that are going around. If we want to move to the circular economy, it will be interesting if we can uh, track and, and change these resources to see where they are and how they will move along and we will get much more information about what we have and what we don't have. Great. Yeah. And just briefly, um, bottom left, augmented reality. Is that, is that where we're coming from here? But maybe more than that. 
Uh, yes, that is augmented realities. And also there's so much um, human machine interaction going on at the, the touch interfaces. So I think this is really your line of work. Yeah, where you are. So, yeah. Right, but yeah. you're working well, as far as I see, if you say AI and data analysis, there's one really interesting problem, which is uh, we don't have theory to recognize the patterns. So uh, a computer could actually say, here's a pattern, but what, what does it mean? Uh, why is it useful um, for what will we uh, actually uh, apply it for? Uh, so, so that's one problem not really cracked right now. I mean. You can recognize patterns in whatever, but what are they actually? And are they real patterns or not? So this is where we lack theory and science actually to interpret those data. The other thing is uh, augmented reality, but many other forms of uh, human computer interaction, such as robots. Um, all this information coming out of these data should be fed back to the user. But the user is not really uh, interested or educated in reading bar charts or uh, uh, graphs or uh, what does 80% humidity mean, I don't know. But if you can translate it to something that can uh, relate in a human communication manner, like people want to be talked to, then you have something that is emerging because those technology can help you understand what's actually going on and what you perhaps could do. So. In my case, a social robot could be the interface between all that's happening on the internet, everything that you can derive from data, and translating it into something that people can understand. Great, and we're going to come on to the social robot in a minute, because right. you've teased us a little bit with it there. Right. Um, and just to say very quickly and to move on, that we're talking about improvements in uh, digital instruction, uh, translating digital instructions to the physical world. Yeah. So yeah. that is mainly, I think, about 3D and even uh, 4D printing, yeah. which you now have. Um, and I think also there, learning from nature could be really helpful in this um, in this realm. Because if we keep just 3D, do the 3D printing with all the old materials that we have, not so much will change. But if we can start using more bio-inspired materials that are more benign to our, our own health and the environment, that could be a main driver. But also now that everybody can become a producer and consumer at the same time, mm -hmm. that are things that are changing our world. And um, so, you know, from, from my background, a, a nice example could be like in nature, we use structural color, for instance, we use structure to make color. We don't, many organisms don't use dye to make the colors. So if, if you see a peacock, it, we see all these beautiful colors, but in fact, a peacock is completely brown. And we see these different colors because of the different layers that are in the, in the feathers that reflect and retract the light in different wavelengths. So if we can find uh, maybe the recipe for to how to print blue or how to print yellow, then we could make many surfaces of cars and textiles and maybe even buildings uh, without dyes. And that could be a big wow. change yeah. to yeah. our world. Huge. Yeah. yeah, an earth-friendly way. Mm -hmm. An earth-friendly way for 3D printing. Excellent, yeah. excellent. Well, listen, I, I don't want to keep the viewers waiting any longer. I want to look at this <laughs> social robot video that we've been talking about. And just before we play the video, um, you, you played the lead research role in this particular project we're about yeah, to see. Sure. Yeah, OK. Just, we'll come back and we'll talk about that in just a second. But watch this short video. You'll see a bit of uh, what Johan's all about, what his expertise is in. You're going to love this video. Uh, so keep watching. In 2024 hebben wij vier keer zoveel 80-jarigen als dat we nu hebben. Drie kwart van de mens van 80 heeft iets waardoor je zorg nodig hebt. Hallo, ik ben Alice. Kan je me goed verstaan? Jazeker. U vertelde me over uw zoon, Jeroen. Ik heb ze goed onthouden, Alice. Dat woont u leuk. Ik ben er nog en ik probeer me nog te handhaven. Dat is alles. De postcode is 1057 BA. Dirk Anton. Niet Dirk, maar Bernard. Hè? Dit is mijn man en dat is Jeroen. Iets hoger. Nog hoger. Knappe man. Zullen we even naar buiten gaan? Ja, als je dat wil. 
Wacht, nog een paar keer. Dit wordt uw nieuwe vriendin. <laughs> Hoor je dat? Jij wordt mijn nieuwe vriendin. Wat leuk. Voelt u zich wel eens eenzaam? Jazeker. Dat voel ik elke dag wel. Oh, dat is jammer. Dit is geen hulp. Dit is dat zij nog eens helemaal bewust wordt van het feit dat ze zo eenzaam is. Ja. Ja. Ik heb vernomen dat het de toekomst zou worden in de zorg. Maar ik sta er nog wel heel sceptisch tegenover. Hoe vindt u dat nou, zo'n robotje in huis? Oh, heerlijk. <lacht> Hup. 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 So there you go. If that was familiar to you, that's not really a surprise because um, that video, I mean, that's the preview video of uh, something a bit longer, and um, the, the longer version was a big international splash. It was in many film festivals and so on. And so, Johan, we said before, you are the lead researcher in that project. That, What's, what's the status now of, of that particular project? Oh, that particular project is actually, uh, it's, it's already gone, 2015, but we, we restarted it in a foundation, the Social Robotics Pop-Up Lab, and that's actually uh, this, but then 10, 10 times greater because everybody can join in there. It's not just researchers and uh, technologists working anymore, but uh, the audience is at large is actually weighing in there and trying to uh, design with us. So by making it, for want of a better word, interdisciplinary, the project has yeah. grown enormously. Yes, exactly. And uh, we see that people like the way we work there. So th that's one thing, but also the topic itself, because uh, it impacts so many layers of life that people want to be there right now to help co-design that future. The, now, the video threw up um, all sorts of questions. Right. And um, the first one that hit me was this idea that a robot can be a carer. And one of the many things yeah. that people say about automation of the workforce is exactly. it's, it's people on uh, the sort of mechanical, low-skilled jobs that are yeah. most at risk. Yeah. And that care, care jobs actually are quite safe for humans because mm -hmm. that's something the robots can't do. But I'm afraid not even the creativity jobs are safe oh. for robots. No, <laughs> but that's another issue. Um, we, we were working from the moral concerns that uh, you couldn't replace empathic uh, tasks by a mechanized doll, right? And by the end of the project, we actually went the other way around. Another moral concern was rising. We, we cannot take them away anymore from those people. Um, because it seems that many emotional tasks can be performed by robots and according to humans, better than humans. What type of tasks are you talking about? Well, one of the things we found out is uh, that, for instance, if a, a doctor has to bring bad news about your health, there are ways he can communicate it properly or not, right? So he does it right or not. If we do the same thing with a robot, it doesn't matter too much how he brings it because people always like the message better. They find the robot a better doctor they estimate a higher quality of life and they adhere to the medical advice better than to the human doctor, which are, I mean, astonishing results. Um, we, we didn't believe what we saw there. Is that driven by the fact that perhaps we have inhibition, uh, less inhibitions when we speak to... Well, they, they, these are emotional tasks, right? And it's not always nice to have someone else who feels emotions as well in front of you. So. Um, one of the, the, the unique selling points of a robot is that it doesn't judge you. So you can cry and it doesn't matter, right? So you don't have to regulate the emotions of the other as well. It will not be impatient with you, right? It doesn't talk about you behind your back. Um, all these things, actually, the things that are missing in a robot as compared to a human, are actually qualities people like. So you, it, it's like sometimes people compare to the stranger on, on the train where you spill all your life events to because you know it has no social consequences for you. That's exactly the role that the social robot plays as well. So people self-disclose to the robot all kinds of stuff they will never tell you or me. But it can maybe be even more themselves. Yes, because it doesn't matter where, whether you have a smelly breath or uh, yeah. how you look or yeah. whether you put your teeth out or what. 
-hmm. That doesn't matter, right? It's just there listening to you. And you say also um, people prefer maybe robots to clean them? Yeah, that, that's something of the other results. Um, I mean, if you ask elderly people, what would you like to be automated most? They say, I want to be washed by a robot. Why? Because, well, when you're old and frail, your body is not that nicely looking anymore. And people feel that too, of course. And then some young guy of 24 years old comes in and says to you, please undress, madam, because I need to wash you. And it's not that same guy that comes the next day. I mean, the next day comes a little girl that's asking you to undress. And I mean, they, they hate that, right? Yeah. So that would be something they would love to give to a machine. Okay, fascinating stuff. Yeah. Thank you, Johan. We're going to come back to Johan in just um, a second and Saskia as well to find out a bit more about um, how uh, robots, computational power and so on might disrupt the work. But most importantly, we want to look at um, what this means and how um, some of these problems could be eradicated. But before we do that, um, there's so much going on at the diff. Uh, my, my good friend, Dragana, is here to tell us about some of the events that are coming up. Hi. Thanks, Colin, and hello to everyone at home. Um, so just a brief moment to, to uh, tell our audience what else is happening at DIFF uh, this year. So the first session um, highlighting is the education and the future of work. This is a session that took place um, last week. And if you enjoyed this discussion, you will certainly love this one because it also goes into um, how we can future-proof our careers. Then next up, uh, later at 3 p.m. today, um, do join us for the session uh, Gaming the Circular Economy. Uh, here we'll, we will have two, um, two inventors of board games who will um, show us how learning about the circular economy can actually be fun. So stay tuned for that one. And then next, at 5 p.m. later today, we will dis continue the discussion on artificial intelligence, but now exploring it from a context of um, how we do scientific research. And then next, um, another, another uh, graphic produced by Scriberia. Uh, Scriberia has been capturing the highlights of um, our sessions throughout this week. Um, this one looks into how the, the New York startup uh, Spacious uh, helped us, helps us to accommodate a digitally empowered uh, workforce using um, commercial buildings. And last but not least, make sure to stay tuned with us. Uh, join the conversation through using the hashtag uh, ThinkDiff on Twitter. Post your comments below on the homepage of this session. Um, we also have the interactive graphics uh, available to you. Uh, you can also use the current interactive graphic for this session to post your comments, and it's the, the interactive graphic on disruptive technologies. Okay, that's all for me. Back to you, Colin. Thanks very much, Shagana, and that's a crazy name you came up with, Interactive Graphics. Let's just show uh, the online audience what we mean by uh, uh, Interactive Graphics. We've got a little video here that's playing. So as uh, Dragana was showing us, there's a link on the homepage, you can get to these graphics. And what, what these are all about, really, is a way of helping you interact with, with each other as an online audience and with the DIFF team. So we set up um, five different graphics looking at various different themes. This one here is looking at disruptive technologies, so very relevant to today's session where we ask a bunch of questions about um, these different, uh, 10 different technologies in this case. You can click wherever you like on the screen and you can leave your comment. And as I say, there's five of these graphics and they're on various different themes. Um, there's a cracking one, lots of interaction on this the other day um, about a mobility options. This one's about automated vehicles, actually, which is something that you guys, uh, Johan and Saskia, are interested in as well, right? It's part of that whole automation argument. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so that's just a, a quick look at um, these interactive graphics. So I want to come back to um, that point. That, so we talked about this major potential for disruption uh, because of these technologies. Right. Um, and Saskia, you think, uh, you think that there's, there's, there's obviously a role for the state but the state has to evolve in some way in order to cope with the disruption that's likely to come through changing technologies and so on. 
Yeah, I, th I think, and it's, um, I, we see it in our own country, but I think you see it in many other countries happening right now, that our solutions that we propose, or that n not so much our solutions, but mm -hmm. the state solutions, is really going back to how we've done things for, for ages. Um, we see, uh, states used to see it as a threat, and therefore they want to protect the old, the old jobs. They see what as a threat, sorry? Um, these disruptive technologies, mm -hmm. they see it as a threat that we will lose so many jobs and we think that we need to protect the old jobs. Um, and that is, um, and maybe in politics it's also something <laughs> to generate more votes, that, mm -hmm. to, to put lots of emphasis on that. But I think that it's much more, we have reached that tipping point. We know in our country that there is currently about 150,000 jobs out and uh, vacancies out, but there's maybe two million people looking to change their jobs. So there is a total mismatch. And we are moving away from the time that, that companies would say, hey, we have a vacancy, come join us, where we now have many more people that are trying to make their own work. And this is actually uh, something from, from another person in our innovation cabinet, Wim de Ridder, he's a, a futurist, and he's done lots of research into that and is also describing how we should deal with that. And that is something um, I, you know, I, we literally see and feel every day. I know so many people that are trying now to make their own jobs. So it's much more like a self-organization, bottom-up um, movement that is starting also in the, in the job market. And is this the rise in freelancing um, in recent years? There was a yeah. stat on a diff uh, session last week, I think it was, uh, the number of freelancers has nearly doubled between 2000 right. and 2014. Yes. Is that, yes. Do you think that's as a result of people just deciding they have to go do things themselves? I think so, yeah, yes. I think, so too. Yeah. I think people are starting to look at what sort of networks they want to be part of. They, they meet new people. Um, you try to find people that think alike, want to you know, make change in the same direction, and you start exploring what you could do together. And that is a very different way of working. And sometimes you end up, you, you bring in skills and capabilities, but not always, it, I, I end up doing work that I'm maybe not, um, uh, what is it, trained for to do. But because you know these networks and you bring in a way of thinking, it's not so much more about what you've learned and what you think, but how you think and how you learn that will help you to be more uh, adaptive and flexible for this future work. So let's ask you, Johan, that, yeah. that has implications for how we educate people in that case. Oh, absolutely, because our whole societal si system, including education, is actually based on the Industrial Re Revolution of 1850, where everything is uh, segmented and, and, and uh, broken down into little pieces. And if all the little pieces do what they have to do, then together it will be one big machine that actually will produce whatever you want to. And that's a way of working that's gone because everybody, I mean, there is no monopoly on information anymore. Everybody can look into each other's discipline and see how they do it. So it's far more important to know how the principles of these different disciplines are and apply them to other domains than to know the exact nitty gritty detail of that one expert, which is fine, which is wonderful, um, but that's not necessarily what will keep you going through a changing world because then the world needs to be fixed. Like a machine, knowing what you do, employ that one little resource, um, uh, mon monopolize it because that's what you can do and you cannot switch anymore, right? But if it's needed to switch, like we see today, there's so much information that you can use, there's so many intercontinental traveling going on so that we know how different peoples are working and perceiving the same issues. That's where you need to be able to apply those principles of one field into another. That also implies that we need to be educated in technology and be educated in media in order not to be enslaved by it but know how to apply it. And this is a new kind of teaching which is not there yet. So, and the implications are for the state are enormous I guess of so, yeah. having to make these changes. Because on the one hand you have the disgruntled workforce, they want to keep on doing what they're used to. On the other hand you have the new generations who need to be prepared for a new life. And I think the state would have a real function there if they on the one hand could 
maintain the workforce and keep the kind of work they are used to for another 10, 15 years until those people are retired and at the same time start up the new way of thinking, working and teaching. And this is a discussion we had off camera earlier. Right. I'd, I'd ask that point about what do you do with people who perhaps don't have university degrees, who are in the more mechanical jobs True. that are perhaps most at risk, although your video about I guess Alice. So. Yeah. Um, so, and so your argument is the state has to be um, has to be quite compassionate. Absolutely. Yes. It, it, it's no time for uh, tough competition right now. Although we see completely different trends. That, that's actually very unproductive, what we're doing right now. And the work of the cabinet, innovation cabinet that you work, you work with, are you, are you advising the government? Yeah, yeah, through our prime minister. Yeah, <laughs> he, he, he's doing that, yeah. Okay, <laughs> and, what, and is this advice you're giving them on education? Uh, yeah, and, for instance, it could be like this. I mean, uh, yeah. th this would be one strand, yes. Okay. And we have been part of, there is now a whole series around um, the global sustainability goals, but we try to put right. in our thinking so we are part of larger networks that yeah. are starting to have a debate about this. Be because, because it's really nice that old industry sets those new goals, but they have no new ne means to achieve them. That's the main problem right now. Right. Okay, let me just say to the online audience, we've got about 10 minutes left of this session. If you do have any questions or comments you want to put to Saskia and Johan, please put them in using the window just underneath the video you're watching this on. Or you can um, send us your comments to hashtag thinkdiff on Twitter and we'll make sure that Saskia and Johan get those questions. Um, Saskia, I want to come back to you. You, th you think that um, uh, we need to knowledge, uh, sorry, harness the knowledge of the crowd. Um, we need co-design is going to be a big part of the future. Interdisciplinary work as well. Right. well what does this um, all imply for individuals? What, what, how, how do they get in in this game? Well, um, what, what I am seeing now is that uh, many organizations start to recognize that, okay, they have some people employed, but it's not necessarily that the people they have employed are the very best, mm -hmm. and there are maybe 700 around in, in, out in the world that know the same or know even more. So they, the ones that are forward thinking are inviting these larger crowds to, to think along with them, to work along with them. They start organizing these, these hackathons or where you sometimes online where they uh, put out challenges as individuals you can come up with ideas so you are part of the design process um, with for for customers that are far away that you don't know themselves but you can uh, give some input there and um, especially well in my line of work in biomimicry is all about disciplinary work because you you need the biology the biologists you need the designers the engineers and at the end the, the business people to make it all work and I am seeing more and more groups of people from different set of skills that come together to, if we want to address the complex challenges that we're facing, you cannot do it with just one skill set. So this is something I see that organizations and both individuals are recognizing. And there's, there's a lot of stuff happening that is bringing those two together. Well, you know, we've got such a great audience that right on cue when I ask for questions, in comes wow. one that's relevant for now. So Francis has said, well, what about money? You know, it's all fine and well saying um, people can uh, apply, sorry, be, that, that people can attend uh, hackathons, but where does their income come from? Well, for, for some of those challenges, these companies are setting rewards, so, um, which are fixed rewards. I know one is like a, a Innocentive, you can just look them up. And um, they, they, will, they will set prices for what they consider good ideas. So this, I know some people who are making money out of this. Um, but the thing is, I think you need to invest some of your time and energy to start working with people, that to find ways to start projects that, and if you can see where the value is going, then you involve those people that would be interested in either the, the, the cost savings or the, the money you could make through the projects. And that's when you start involving them as well. Um, and we also talked earlier about um, some sort of safety net that perhaps the state would need if we are going to see more yeah. people unemployed. Uh, I don't know it's not your expertise, but the, there's this basic income scheme that's been trialed in the Netherlands somewhere. Is that right? Yes. I don't know too much about it, but perhaps you do. In no, Utrecht, right? I know it's in Utrecht on a city level, or not the whole city. Um, and, and, you know, we both are not economists, so it's, it's, I'm hearing lots of pros and cons. 
Uh, it, I think it would be, it's really good at re experimenting with it. Yeah. I wish the Swiss would have, uh, they, they, they had a referendum on it. They yeah. had a choice of doing it and it would have been great to see what would come out of it. Absolutely. Maybe it can be an, an option for, you know, part-time basic right. income for people. So they, they have the safety to start, have the basic income and still can try to make their own work. Yeah, perhaps I can give an example. Please, yeah. from, from the social robot lab we just established, what I see there is that people give up their uh, one-fifth, so one day of their steady job to work in the lab because then they can do something they think is fulfilling. So it's not about monetary reward, but about uh, a purposeful life. And what you see then is that all these new innovations are picked up by the industry, for instance, they evolve it into some new service or product and then pay back from it to the foundation, to, to, the, to the lab. And well, that's a way of earning money, right? Because that can be divided among people as well. So it's, it's a new way of actually investing and, and seeing your returns. It's not about profit maxima maximization anymore. That's, that's not so, but it's more about sharing. What about, what about um, security and planning for the future? I guess that's a concern of mine, that in a, in yeah. a world of constantly freelancing and finding new projects, it, it feels less secure than well, I being employed. It's, it's not secure anymore already, because since 2008, you, you see what they do with our money. So no, people cannot go in, in retirement because they, I mean, that, that old capitalism actually blew it. Um, so what's actually really your, your safe anchor is your flexibility in knowing how to get, uh, uh, how to shape your world such that you can make money out of it. So those are new skills and they can actually be taught, but they are not taught in school because the school is still mm -hmm. in the old mode, right? Old school thinking. Um, th this, is, this is the new world we are entering. And, and that will be your real security, that you are actually capable of dealing with it. Okay, I want to um, come on to a couple more audience questions. That they're coming in thick and fast right now. But before we do, Saskia, you, you think the circular economy and biomimicry have a role to play in uh, the future of work. Could you just give us your, your brief selling pitch for that? Yes, well, you know, if you, you could see the circular economy as a, on a systems level, um, a mimicking of natural systems because everything there is running into continuous loops. Every, there's no waste in nature. And what we see there is that there is a place within these continuous loops for, for many different organisms to play a role. Um, so there will be, there's pr producers, there are consumers, and there is what we in biology call detrivores, like earthworms that will take apart um, materials and bring them back to atoms and molecules so they can be reused again. So there's really not just one starting point in a continuous loop. But I think that's not really how we look at the circular economy these days. We are very much focused at, okay, how can we bring back these um, resources and materials? And I think there's, there's a big niche, a big gap for organizations and companies to be filled to break that down and, and, and bring these resources back. Um, in Sweden, we just learned that they have, uh, they, they're recycling so much that they don't have enough waste that they import it also from here, from the UK. But they also pick aside uh, some waste streams that can be fixed or repaired and be reused again. So that could be also an opportunity for maybe new jobs for less highly educated people to play in that r bigger uh, circular economy system. Sure, and they've just cut VAT as well in repair, haven't they? Which yeah. one imagines is a much more industrious right, uh, role. Right, so. right. I mean, yeah. that's the hope, isn't it? A, a, a model like the circular economy is a more industrious one, so more yes. people could be employed. Right, yeah. So I don't think that's because some people are very much pro. Some people think that it will um, reduce the number of jobs. I think it will be a shift in jobs. Mm -hmm. Mainly. In fact, every study has, has argued that point so right. far. Yeah, many right. studies have been made. Right. Yeah. So more questions have come in from the audience, and please keep them coming in. Thanks on uh, all the usual routes. You know about that by now. Uh, so we have a question here that's coming from Louise. Uh, one for you, I think, to start with, Johan. Who decides what values are embedded in automated systems algorithms? You've been asked this before, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. Automation has the potential to disenfranchise huge swathes of the population. Black mirror anyone? 
Do you know what Black Mirror is? Yeah, I've heard about it. Great yeah. TV but show. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's an excellent question because you shouldn't leave it to the technologists. Uh, this is also why we have these, these huge discussions. I mean, technology or science is not value free, right? So it's also the vision of the person who is performing it that will go into the AI, for instance. So that's why we make stuff together with people who are going to use it to know what prejudice we have, right? And then we try to make it such that you can adapt the system so that it will serve your perspective or that it can actually take another perspective as a mirror to you. So we try to avoid actually that uh, one way of seeing the world is implemented through a technology onto the user. Is that, I mean, is that a conscious decision that yeah. technologists and scientists are taking that this has to be taken out of their hands and, and shared? There are a few scientists who see it that way. I think we're pretty unique there in how we do it. But not all, right? Sorry? But not all. There's still room for a Hollywood script of robots running amok. Oh yeah, of course, because if, if you're a nasty person, you can make nasty things, of course. I mean, I, I don't think the American army is uh, uh, implementing AI to be empathic with the enemy, right? And yes, if it goes into the wrong hands, you have another atom bomb, yeah. For sure, but you, we don't have to do that, right? Sure. It's something we designed as a society to do. Mm -hmm. And it's that interdisciplinary thing, it's yeah. that learning from one another, which we've heard about a lot in the Disruptive Innovation Festivals, you might not be surprised to hear. Mm -hmm. Another question, a JP Denke says, are you concerned that the information and therefore power goes to a few companies and tech hubs like Silicon Valley? Who needs to keep an eye on this? We all do. Yes, if we, if we keep on, uh, organizing the world as is from a neoliberal perspective, this is what happened. That's why we need to reorganize also the way we, we, we have shaped our societies, right? And who is going to keep an eye on that is we all do, because that technology has to be transparent. We have to know what everybody is doing with our data. This is also something we do in the social robotics lab, because if people, um, spill their life events to a social robot, that information shouldn't go on Facebook, right? And shouldn't be analyzed by Amazon and then doing the next advertisement for your tissues, right? Sure. Um, so this is actually data security should be really, really serious. And it should also be, for, as far as I'm concerned, in your home, physically there, you are actually in charge of your own data. And on the other hand, we need to know what the technology is doing to data. So yes, all the Googles and Facebooks and Microsofts need to open up what they, are actually, what they actually have there. The new Watson should be available to everybody to hack it, to see it, what's actually there in order to know what they will do with all that information. Because otherwise, yes, they will be in charge. Right, well, it sounds like you've got some sensible ideas there. Let's hope that they come to fruition. Uh, and with that in mind, Saskia, the very last question is um, this, the innovation cabinet that you're working on, right. what's the, f wh when, when does that conclude? Does it conclude and, and in what way? Um, Can we read about it at one, at one point? Yeah, well, we, we have, uh, so other than our official cabinet, we have been just appointed. So it's a very subjective uh, cabinet. Um, we, we don't have to uh, um, apologize or respond on anything. Extremely undemocratic. Yes, and it's, uh, um, but we are there for four years. Yeah, we said right. we, do, we, do, we do it four years and this is the second time they've done it. There has been other people in the previous one and it's really, I think, up to our own availability and how much passion you get in being part of it. And also, together, we decide what we want to work on and what we see as the best way to put our energy in. And the Dutch government are listening? Well, sometimes they do. Well, Not I always. Mean, no, well, but <laughs> we, we had, for instance, our Senate visit the robot lab to, in order to talk about what should legislation do here. I mean, that was really like forward thinking, I'd say, that yeah. they're already trying to prepare uh, what should be a robot law or can the machine be self-conscious? Can, can we make it responsible for something or not? Yeah. So they were discussing that with, yeah. uh, with us. And I think that, that, yeah, that's where you see where the payoff is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm now with so the they're not running behind the development, right? Right. 
Right, I think we've run out of time now, folks. So thanks so much for joining us here in the sofa today in our live studio. Johan, Saskia, it's been a real pleasure listening to you tell us about this disruption of jobs. Um, and let me say to the online audience then that um, thank you so much for joining us in this session. I hope um, that the words of Saskia and Johan had plenty of hope that uh, all of our jobs aren't going to be taken away. My line manager, as it happens, keeps telling me that my job is prime for disruption. Uh, tune in at three o'clock to find out if I've survived the afternoon. Goodbye for now. <laughs>